move, uh, inviting is the last speaker, um, Fred Robinson from Cambridge, who has done everything for ankle surgery. He's written over 50 papers. He runs the unit, which is very busy in Cambridge. He's been the president of the Bofast uh, uh, Society. Uh, he's written lots of government guidelines uh, with NICE and uh, the College of Surgeons, the BOA. So uh, we'd like to welcome uh, a true expert, Fred. Thank you very much, Rick. Yes, I'm very old, I think, is what you've really said. <laughs> that's, that's what I meant. <laughs> Well, well done. We're almost there. Um, thanks for a lovely day. Thank you for inviting me. I think it's, it's really um, good, this multidisciplinary thing that we seem to be getting into. So, the, the midfoot. Where are we going? That's my disclosure. Um, I thank Venue for all the advertising he's done of our nail. It's absolutely marvellous. So I, I need to say no more. Um, so, really, what we're talking about is, is the Charcot foot. Okay? We start with this. But this is usually what we see. I, I'd love to see many more early Charcot's. I don't know whether they get snaffled and not seen because they're seen by, uh, in the clinic and I don't get to see them. But really, we are seeing a lot of advanced disease, and that's the problem. So this is rare. This is a much more common presentation. And this is really the problem we're trying to deal with with midfoot uh, Charcot. This is a fantastic, I love this, Luchon's classification. Okay, Classic orthopedic, three, four is too many. Okay, not bad, terrible, okay? A, B, C. Thank you, Lou. But really what we're looking at is what Tim has been talking about, this bump underneath. If you walk on a bump like that with bone underneath, you get an ulcer. It's pressure. It's nothing else. I train with Jim Brodsky. This is his classification of um, Charcot. But really the important thing here is here, most of it is really in the midfoot. This is really what, the, what we see the majority of. The ankle... I see. I've probably fixed more Charcot ankles this year than I have this. But the ankle is poisonous. As soon as you start going into varus or valgus, you're going to ulcerate, and that's trouble. So early nailing, get onto that and fix it. This is a much commoner disease, but the majority of them we don't need to operate on. So what are we trying to do? As I said, the surgery is and it's in the ankle is less stable, it's prone to progression, and I think we've got some better fixation techniques. This is the nail, okay? But there's these, which are locking plates, and you can see, and I'm just mentioning that now, is the screw actually bolts into the plate, so you produce a much more rigid construct. Okay, so the screw has a th head, has a thread on it, which goes in and locks into that, and you really create a completely rigid structure, and there's no toggle, if you like, of the screw in the plate. I mentioned I'll come back to that. So we know the outcome. We've looked at this, you know, the, the amputations, bracing, recurrent ulceration, this is not a benign disease. This, is, is it the gold standard? I think we're moving away from that, but it's certainly the workhorse. I think that's a better term, okay? We still use a lot of total contact casting. We will continue to use that, whether it be post-operative or not. So we mustn't forget this technique. As I think it was um, Dane Wukic said, the aim is to restore stability whilst maintaining alignment, prevent deformity, get the patients on their feet. It's good for their general health, an ulcer-free prescription, probably in shoes which we've provided with insoles and braces. The indications are this. If you can't hold it, if you can't keep it where it is with the, the, the total contact cast, I think we do need to think about fracture treatment. I'll, I'm going to present a case at the end. But I think just, just bear in your mind, some of these patients have a very acute presentation. Some progress slowly, but some it just, just falls to pieces. Some of these patients have fractures. And I think Charlie Saltzman did some stuff years ago when he looked at, he, he did bone density. And if you do bone density in Charcot feet, you find there are two patterns. One where the bone density is, is maintained and it's a ligamentous problem. And the second where the bone density reduces and it's a fracture pattern. It's worth thinking about that because they're different things. Think about the soft tissues, but think, is it a fracture or the ligaments falling to pieces? Okay, what we're not aiming for is a normal foot, okay? That is, frankly, unrealistic. That's what we're going for. We're going for bony union. If you can get bony union, it is much better. We quite often fail and had fibrous union. Okay, so exostectomy, Tim's talked about. It it's works, it's good. 90% uh, limb salvage, Jim Brodsky. Here, we've taken the soul, so that, that off and it's, it's functioning well. So in the mature foot, that's a good option. Remember the blood supply, it's rare, but you, you do occasionally get a Charcot with poor blood supply. I think infection, it's quite simple. If, this, if the soft tissues are intact, if there's never been a break in the skin, 
It's very unlikely. It's very unlikely to be infected. That's served me well for 20 years. It's rare as hen's teeth. If you're looking at hematogenous spread, it's rare. OK, the questions. When? Which patients are we going to operate? If we're going to operate on all of these. There'd be a lot of patients. There's going to be a lot of fallout. The trouble with this surgery is it's not benign. Patients have problems. They have long recovery. And if we can avoid surgery, you are avoiding the complications. And complications do occur, certainly in my practice. The timing. When are we going to do this? Fixation techniques. And as Venus said, we're all talking. We're all, we're all orthopedic surgeons. We're all terrified of infection because once you get infection around a bit of metal, it ain't going away. When to operate? We are getting some evidence on this now. I mean, traditionally, we used to do it sort of down here when everything was resolving and healing. But I think, can we do early preventive surgery? I think we can. Okay, there's this, this, these papers. This is looking at 14 stage one patients. Um, they all did very well. And in this, this was a larger series, still not a big series. The evidence is poor, but it didn't matter whether you operated in stage one, two, or three uh, Eichenholz. So I think there is, a, there is a thing, and I think you're hearing that more and more this afternoon. Should we be fixing some of these patients acutely? Don't forget, if, if your foot looks like that, your Achilles tendon is going to be tight. So if you stick that foot on straight, the foot is going to be down here. So you have to release the, the Achilles tendon. Okay? You need to start out doing that. Frankly, it's often a tenotomy. It's very, very tight. So you need to bring the foot up because then when you've corrected it, the foot comes up there. This is Lou shown of a more, classic, a more complex classification of his. But really, if we're talking about the midfoot, we go back. Okay? We go tarsal metatarsal through the navicular cuneiform and then to the mid-tarsal joint. And with that progression, you go from a tarsal metatarsal fusion to a navicular cuneiform fusion. Here, you fuse the mid-tarsal joint. But when you're getting back here, the subtalar joint is likely to be unstable. And the heel will go into valgus and will disappear off, off, off sideways. And really what you're looking at is the talus rotating. And you start to get complete dissociation of the hind foot. So when we talk about that, when we talk about these sort of injuries, we probably want to do a triple fusion, which is where you fuse one two, three joints, okay? The subtalar joint, the talar navicular, and the calcaneo cuboid. You may want to put a rod, as you saw Venu doing, up through the ankle, but it's nice to try and keep some movement because if you make everything completely rigid, they are, the patients are prone to ulceration under the forefoot because they're so, so stiff. The principles, you've heard about wedges. We need to remove bone usually to get things reduced. And we're aiming for fusion, although we may not achieve it. So I tend to use a plantar medial approach for these patients, unless I'm doing something very extensive. Okay, that allows me to put the plate on the undersurface of the arch, the medial longitudinal arch, which is the tension side, and biomechanically that's much more stable. The tibialis anterior gets in the way, and you can just lift that off subperiosteally and flap it back at the end. Now you're taking out quite big wedges. So it's quite useful sometimes to put some wires in. These are just... Uh, this is just PowerPoint, not real. You can put wires in under x-ray control, and then you can run your chisel, your osteotome, or your saw along those wires, and that allows you to plan your, your wedges without, uh, so, so they go in the right direction, essentially, because you use, use the wires to, you know, the, the saw doesn't go through the wire, it'll go through the bone. And you can bring it out in the cuboid. Usually just a medial, uh, a medial approach. Sometimes with the more complex, and I'll show you one where I didn't later, the third method, you need to make a lateral incision as well. Okay, do you need to extend to an un a next unaffected joint? You probably do in many cases, but try not to stiffen too much, I would say. You've got options. You can use screws, you can use plates, or you can use external fixation. We'll look at those. It is very important to compress the bones. If you cut the bones out, you push them together tightly, you get a much more stable fix. We spend a lot of time practicing on plastic bones, and it really is very apparent. If you've got a gap, things wobble around, they move around very significantly. If you squeeze them together, actually you get much better intrinsic stability and those fractures will heal. Often you need to take out bones. So this is the medial lateral intermediate cuneiform. They're disposable, okay? If you've got very tight soft tissues, I would much rather take out more soft tissue, sorry, more bone and allow the soft tissues to come together. I think Venu was saying that, you know, one of the ways of creating uh, uh, soft tissue envelope is actually a lack soft tissue envelope is actually to take out bone. The alternative is to get the plastic surgeons in to do a free flap. That's a much, much bigger thing. Or to leave the plate open, then you risk infection. So I'm pretty fearless about taking bits of bone out. If the foot is smaller, that's really not a bad thing, actually. 
So this is, this is one of the first patients. This, this is about 20 years ago, so we'll look at some really historical stuff here. So this is a lady, I think she was about 70, as I remember it. Um, she had a rocker bottom foot, she kept ulcerating here. So this was the time when we weren't fixing so many. But I didn't really think there was any way creating a line here. We were going to take away a lot of her foot. There's her uh, tarsal metatarsal joint, that sublux is up north. That is going to destabilize, and that's, what, that's Tim's fear. So if that happens, so what I did was this, okay? This is using really historical things, but you can see that she was pretty flat underneath, and that's her foot. So she's been ulcerated for about two, you know, for a couple of years, I think, and this was just after I started, and we achieved that. She's long dead now, but she died with her foot and that. Um, one of the things I talked about was going medially and going plant immediately. So underneath the first ray. So this is a 50-year-old man, okay, you can see he's got this poisonous pattern of dislocation, essentially, of his foot. So what I've done here is gone underneath here and put in screws and plates, and you'll see there's a plate underneath, that's the tension side, so it doesn't open up, and then there are compression screws up here for the orthopedic uh, members of, the, the, um, of the, the audience. But really what we're trying to do is get everything pushed together. And then <clears throat> we've done something you shouldn't do, which is fuse all the way across the foot, People think you can't fuse these joints because they need to move about, but actually you can, and that produced a really nice stable foot. No idea where this guy is now. Then uh, Mathieu Sal, who is, is a, a Swiss, came in and he talked about uh, the super construct, which is, and these are, these are, you know, this is orthopedic porn. I mean, people love looking at this stuff. I mean, this is, this is easy to sell, okay? And this is putting a screw in through the talus, through the back, and along that. I mean, that, that's fun, isn't it? That's a challenge. That's like trying to thre you know, thread the eye of a needle. It's terrific fun. And then Jim Samarco, whose father was also Jim Samarco, Jim Samarco Jr., he, he came in the other way, and he put them in through the toe that way. So this is fun. This is actually me doing it, so that's one of my own. This is really difficult. It's really difficult. It's difficult to get the, the screws all the way up into the talus because actually the talus is slightly medial, the angulation. You're going through joints, whether it be the back of the angle or here. The other problem with this is you're actually creating... No, you're not really getting a good fit. Okay, yeah, There's a bit of toggle, and you don't get good fixation. So I'm not totally convinced this is a good technique. We use it, I noticed Ven is using it less than he was about five years ago, and this is something I'm using less. I'm relying more on screws and plates, and maybe using a longitudinal screw with a plate over it, because actually what that does is gives you the stability and compression of the plate, plus the longitudinal strength of a six and a half or eight millimeter screw. There we go, there's one. With a medial planter plate, and that, okay, so that's gone. So that's where we started with everything all in pieces, and that's come. Now, I'm not sure this is ever going to unite, but you've got a good foot-shaped foot, which you can shoe. So this is an acute fracture pattern. So, you know, we say we ought to put the stage zero into, into plasters. Well, this one was put in, and I accept it's not a very good plaster, but these are the dates, okay? And that actually deteriorated from a normal foot to this in a month in a plaster. So... It, we're not going to find the cure by avoiding this completely. So once you get further back, and here you can see the tail and navicular joint is gone, and also the foot is abducting. So that's the longitudinal axis of the talus, and this is the foot. So everything's heading off sideways. That's the one where you need to bring it back, and here you can see the longitudinal axis of the talus is now straight up the first ray. But actually, I have gone back to the sub joint and fused this whole complex with staples, screws, the whole shebang, um, and that actually um, will give you a much more stable fix. So that's the triple fusion, which is a standard orthopedic operation, but actually it's the thing is not to just limit yourself to this. You have to extend that. So here's one that didn't go so well. So again, we've got dislocation here. So I went for the longitudinal screws from the back this time, and I ended up with that. Okay, so not bad, actually. Quite a flat foot, a little bit of bone here, but I think the patient did fine. But really, what this taught me was sometimes you need to... That's the second metatarsal, which has popped up and I've not reduced. Sometimes you need to extend laterally and make a second incision to actually reduce and hold that. This was an interesting patient I was referred from elsewhere. How are we doing for time again? Okay. So this patient arrived in the clinic. That was his X-ray, okay? So here we've got a number of dissociated bones, okay? Tibia, talus... Sub, uh, calcaneus, uh, I mean, there's just nothing touching nothing. So we had to make a decision. This guy was, I think, about 35 stone. So we made a decision, and it was a cowardly surgical decision. I said, 
we'll get some bariatric surgery. Now, I think actually medically that was the right decision, to be honest, because his mortality, his perioperative problems were absolutely huge. He got down to 20 stone, and I, thought, I then felt pressured I had to do something. Let me tell you, you ain't going to achieve anything operating on that. What I achieved was a talectomy and a floppy foot, which was in a good position, but I could not get the soft tissues to move around that to reduce it and hold it. So actually what we did was a talectomy, and this guy still walks around. He's got a, shark, a crow walker, uh, and he's very happy, and he's a lot lighter than he was. Infection is our bugbear, okay? Once you've got that, sometimes it will just hear a total contact cast. So usually I try and get things healed. What we do know is that the Elizaroff frames are a problem, okay? You can either internally fix, which is these ones, when you have deep infections, wound healing problems, or you can, uh, you can use a, a frame when you get uh, ulcer recurrence and radiographic non-unions. So I'm, I think, like Venu, I'm much more about internal fixation. We do use an external frame, very rarely, with tibial half pins, and we just use that to temporarily support. Make sure you debride, you get an accurate microbiological diagnosis and appropriate, and then you can implant. So normally, we achieve, I, I will either do an exostectomy or fixation, get them healed, get the skin intact, I've got some cultures off, and then I'll go back and fix it when everything's intact. So here we are. Don't forget this stuff. Start with that, and then you can progress on, get things healed, and you can fix. Just one last comment, okay? They've just done some work looking... This is the, the structure we talked about earlier. And I think there's a general perception that orthopaedic surgeons aren't terribly involved in foot and ankle surgery. We've just done an audit. We're more involved. And it's really going quite well, to be perfectly honest. I was quite surprised. So everybody's got... This was an audit of all the trusts in the UK. Uh, England, sorry, not the UK. Um, we had orthopaedic input into the multidisciplinary foot service in 40%. And uh, orthopedic surgeons are actually draining more, or more diabetic abscesses than vascular surgeons. And I think this is something we have to embrace and we have to look at. The old general surgeon doesn't exist anymore. So you're going to struggle if you're in a spoke to get somebody to operate on the foot unless that person is an orthopedic surgeon. And we need orthopedic engagement to look after and care for these patients. It may not be a, a foot and ankle specialist, but that's something we need to work on uh, and improve. And I think we're making significant progress. So that's good. So what should I do? Here we go. 66-year-old lady uh, referred to me last Friday through the major trauma network, which is slightly unusual. Um, this, this was the, fo fo the photo I was sent. Okay, you've got a big uh, blister here. You've got a red foot. I don't know what... You've got an air-cast boot on the other foot. Where do we go? What do we do with that? So calm down is the first one, okay? There is a bone, it is broken, I can fix it. No, just stop, okay? There's, what, I don't know, has this lady got a kidney pancreas transplant? I, you know, what's her diabetic control like? Is she septic? Has she got any, you know? We really don't know what's going on. So we just stop. We say, what are we going to do? We get the multidisciplinary team involved, usually not the vascular surgeon, but I need Tony Cole, who I work with, to help me with all the medical problems. Is she on clopidogrel? Is she on, you know, all of these things need sorting out. Sort out the medical care. Find out about her life and her comorbidities. These are people. We must, must find out what's going on. And we'll have a little bit of a think. Okay, well, I had that. She came in on Monday. She'd been discharged on antibiotics. Slightly unusual. <laughs> um, she was non-weight-bearing with no cast. She had a boot on the other leg. Uh, and I'm at a meeting. Those are the x-rays. What do I do? Answers opposed. No, so what I've done is I've left my fellow at home and he's taking out that bone because I think that's going to ulcerate and I don't think we can wait a week. So we're going to take out the medial cuneiform. We're going to put her in a plaster and we're going to settle that. And this foot is like a balloon. She's been walking around on it for a week. It's a very acute injury. And this is the point. This is really, if you look, there's almost no fracture. This is almost a pure dislocation. This is a soft tissue problem. I don't think there's any prospect of getting away with that without fixing it. So one, maintain the soft tissue integument. Two, give it a time. It would be nice to do it tomorrow, but I really don't think that's realistic um, because the soft tissues are not in condition. And then when we've got the soft tissues, I will go in and fix that. So I think we need to be more aggressive, but it needs a little bit of control. That's my team. That's Sean Deneen. And that's me. We both had black hair. <laughs> it's amazing. The passage of time, a dangerous thing. Thank you very much indeed.